estamos ao vivo. So, uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the first of these webinars uh, prepared by uh, the Brazilian Society of Criminology and the American, Latin American and Caribbean Society of, uh, uh, Association of Criminology. And uh, uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the first of these webinars. A little bit, I'm... Uh, I'm hearing an echo, so this is why I stopped a little bit, but <laughs> I hope that it's everything okay. And uh, this is uh, our first uh, of expected series, at least uh, of seminars, uh, not necessarily related to COVID. What is really interesting at this uh, period because all webinars almost were on COVID. And then we can, uh, I mean, talk about our old problems <laughs> that we still did not uh, resolve. And uh, so this is really uh, a, an interesting opportunity to really exchange ideas and progress in uh, what we are doing among our uh, colleagues from different societies in Latin America and the Caribbean. So uh, the idea is really to have more contacts and uh, we, we are not even together we're not still a, a very large group so and uh, so it's better if you can really do some of the uh, 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 to face some challenge together in terms of uh, and knowing what people other people are doing in the region may be very interesting in terms of cooperation so the the whole idea of the webinar is this, and it's really, I mean, to thank uh, Ricardo Gazzanelli, the Brazilian Society of Monology president, and uh, Oscar, the president of Alassi, uh, for, I mean, uh, really, I mean, having, putting together this uh, uh, possibility of, of us uh, to, to, to perform and uh, offer these seminars to, to the community. Uh, the, the coordination of the, uh, of these webinars are really I mean, uh, on uh, Valdez and myself in terms of uh, the, uh, dealing with that. And uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to, to really put this in. Uh, uh, and we hope that uh, establishing the, the, the seminars, we have more people interested in uh, helping us in, in order to, to promote these and organize uh, the future ones. So, and let me uh, give the floor and uh, of course, the very welcome to our presenters, uh, Adelaida and uh, Valdez that are going to talk uh, to us today, but we are going to present them when they're going to start the talk. And I'll give the floor to Emilio that is uh, Vice President of Alassi that uh, is with us and uh, to, to say uh, a few words to us and uh, the perspective of Alassi in these webinars. Thank you. Thank all you. is yours, Emilio. Thank you, Manuel. And thank you to the SBI for inviting me to this uh, great project. I'm very happy to be here and honored um, well, my, my first uh, work is to present Adelaida, uh, Dr. Maria Adelaida Gomez is a Colombian scientist working on the molecular and cellular aspect of neglected infectious diseases. After her a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology at University de los Andes, Bogotá, um, uh, her PhD at McGill University in Montreal in 2009, she returned to Colombia at the International Center for Training and Medical Research, Cali. Uh, she is now the coordinator of the Molecular Biology and Biochemistry Unit at CIDAIM. She has led several successful national and international research projects founded by WHO, TDR, Cold Sciences, Cold Sciences, I'm sorry, <laughs> NIAID, NIH, and Wellcome Trust. She has also received numerous recognition and awards. Her research aims to unravel the host pathogen interaction and underlying mechanisms that determine the clinical and therapeutic outcomes of human leishmaniasis as a model of tropical infection diseases caused by intracellular pathogens. And today, she will talk about dissecting the determinants of healing and non-healing response in humans 
Good day, Mr. Leish Maniasu. Thank you, Adelaida. Thank you so much, Emilio, for your presentation. And thank you, Professors Dutra and Barral, for this kind invitation. For me, it's super exciting to be here in this uh, Latin American community. And I totally endorse this opportunity that you guys are doing for putting us all together. So let me start sharing my screen and uh, we can start then. Okay. Can you please confirm that you're seeing my slides? Yes, we see. Yes. Okay. Perfect. So, um, yes, I'm going to talk today about the determinants of healing and non-healing responses in human cutaneous leishmaniasis. Essentially, what I wanted to share with you today is kind of a roadmap of uh, work that we have been doing for the past 10 or 15 years, revealing different components of the host pathogen interactions that lead to healing or non-healing outcomes in human cutaneous leishmaniasis. So it's going to be kind of um, uh, pieces of flavors of different uh, uh, works that we have done, um, not going too much into detail in each of them, but just providing a general overview of the relationships that we have studied and the contributors that we have found to these outcomes in cutaneous leishmaniasis. So first, I wanted to give you a very brief introduction on what CAIM is. We are a research center in Cali, Colombia, devoted to biomedical research in uh, neglected infectious diseases. Uh, we conduct research throughout the range of basic translational applied and communitary research. This is something uh, more, more recent. But essentially, we um, go through the spectrum of these research approaches to try and provide answers to uh, the health problems of communities affected by neglected infectious diseases in the country and in the region. We have been a WHO collaborating center in leishmaniasis since 1992. And for the past 10 years, we have been an allied research institution with Universidad Isesi in Cali. So uh, this is just a very brief introduction of leishmaniasis and the impact in our region. So as you can see, Colombia is second to Brazil in the number of cases of cutaneous leishmaniasis reported in the region. Brazil is the first country reporting most of cases. Uh, we report an average of 10,000 cases every year. It has fluctuated and this last year it has uh, uh, diminished. Uh, probably because of underreporting, but essentially it's about uh, 10,000 cases a year. And what I wanted to show you here in these pictures is that the endemic communities for leishmaniasis are communities that share geographical as well as cultural uh, resemblance to rural communities in Brazil that are affected by these same neglected tropical diseases. So we have individuals in communities in remote rural settings that can be along river sites or then can be in the highlands of the country. Uh, and essentially one of the most complicating aspects of this infectious disease is that access of these communities to um, healthcare is uh, uh, impaired because of their location with, within these um, uh, remote areas. One of the things that I find particularly intriguing and fascinating about leishmaniasis and also uh, Chagas disease is that there is a range of clinical manifestations of cutaneous leishmaniasis going from asymptomatic infection to symptomatic infections. And with that, within the symptomatic infections, we also have a range of um, levels of severity that varies within the context of geographical areas between species and among different individual populations. The important thing to keep in mind here is that despite being an infectious disease that is triggered or that pathology is triggered by the parasite, the lesion is a lesion that has um, a, a very strong immunopathological component. That means that the host itself is maintaining the, um, the, the, the disease phenotype itself and contributes to what we call 
healing and non-healing responses. So because this is a parasite elicited inflammatory response and response, and it's a, a response that is sustained by the host, one of the aspects that we have been investigating um, uh, quite predominantly is the participation of host responses in healing and non-healing outcomes of cutaneous leishmaniasis. And when we talk about healing and non-healing responses, one aspect of this healing uh, uh, of these responses is the outcome of treatment. So I just wanted to bring this very brief uh, um, introduction to the therapies that are used for uh, treatment of cutaneous leishmaniasis in our region. We have two main drugs that are used throughout the whole Latin American continent. Uh, the first line is pentavalent antimonials which are 20 days, that's the, the standard regimen, 20 days of therapy of um, uh, injected doses every day. And then we have uh, uh, um, another treatment, which is an oral drug, which is miltefacine. And you can imagine that the access to this oral drug is um, uh, much better than parenteral drug as, as treatment with antimonials is uh, much dependent on clinical ability for providing this type this type of treatment. Despite this, uh, most of the uh, therapeutic approaches that are used in our region um, are based on parental antimonials. And even this is the case, we have very high rates of treatment failure and very high rates of adverse drug reactions. For uh, pentavalent antimonials, we have a range between 20 and even 40% of treatment failure, depending on the species, on the geographical area where you analyze the clinical studies, et cetera. And for miltefacin, we have a, a range of therapeutic failure that goes between 15 to 40%. It is important to mention here that these rates of treatment failure are in cases of controlled clinical trials. So you can imagine that in the regular uh, clinical scenario, these therapeutic failure rates uh, tend to be much higher because of compliance, for example, to the standard therapy. In addition to healing and non-healing responses in the context of therapeutic uh, outcome, which I'm depicting here in these images, we have healing and non-healing responses in the context of just the clinical manifestation of, of disease. So what I have tried to draw here is the spectrum of what we're uh, defining for the purpose of this presentation as healing and non-healing outcomes where we talk about healing outcomes as individuals that can cure in the context of therapeutic interventions or that are asymptomatic or have self-healing lesions. Self-healing meaning individuals that have uh, lesions that in the absence of uh, drug therapy can heal spontaneously. And we are calling non-healing uh, uh, outcomes to those patients that after standard of care treatment do not appropriately resolve their lesions, or those patients that in the absence of treatment continue to develop more severe disease manifestations as you see here. And what we consider as severe manifestations are based on the length of time uh, through which the patient has uh, reported symptoms, usually more than six months, we consider a chronic uh, manifestation, or more severe disease outcomes like mucosal leishmaniasis, for example, that usually occurs in individuals uh, after uh, multiple years of a primary cutaneous lesion, usually. So, so healing and non-healing outcomes. And throughout the presentation, what I want to do is to give you some uh, examples on how we have approached the dissection of these mechanisms that we think are associated with the outcomes of treatment, which can be related to either therapy or the host immune response contributing to the self-healing of lesion. So I have to say first that this slide took me like five hours to do, and I'm very proud of it. So I just want to share it for the first time here because it, 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 I thought it was special. Um, but this is a, a conceptual diagram of the way that I see uh, this story that I'm going to tell you. And what I wanted to show here is that the way I conceptualize, or in general, the community conceptualizes 
um, uh, research in host pathogen interactions for leishmaniasis is based on three general stages of um, host pathogen relationships. The first that we're going to call an immediate interaction where we are talking about the first few hours after the sunfly bites a susceptible host and injects the promastigotes, where the host is exposed to these promastigotes, but also to other factors such as the sunfly saliva. So we initially, uh, let's say we can generalize that these responses are primarily receptor mediated due probably to a uh, pathogen interaction with a receptor in a host cell or a molecular interaction of a saliva molecule and host cells and so on. Then we have a second phase, which we call the early phase, uh, that for the purposes of this presentation, I have um, summarized here between four hours and 24 hours after the parasite is uh, inoculated in the susceptible host where we have this process of phagocytosis and antigen presentation and the transition of promastigotes to intracellular amastigotes within the host cells. So here I want to stop for a little bit because usually this is the, the um, stage that is primarily investigated in, in, um, in general in the community where we have experimental settings that are designed for two hours or six hours or 18 hours, for example, to measure nitric oxide and this type of things. And we usually are very much focused at these early interactions in the host cells. 10 years ago, we were almost exclusively looking at, at uh, macrophages and dendritic cells. Today, we're going beyond and looking into neutrophils as well and other potentially non-phagocytic or non-classically phagocytic cells as um, uh, cells that may harbor the parasite. But um, uh, let's say the hypothesis that I want to bring here is that in addition of uh, early interactions occurring with the host cells, we believe that these early interactions also are taking place with cells of the adaptive immune response. And I hope to share some uh, little information about this in a minute. Uh, then we have a later, okay, so, so here we're talking about innate cells, as I was saying, um, uh, adaptive immune cells, specifically CD4, CD8 T cells and amastigotes. Oops, sorry for the bad writing, anyway. And then we have here the late response, which we are calling uh, once the adaptive immune response is mounted, where uh, usually what we're looking to find is the mechanisms of immune regulation. So what we hope happens here is that an effective adaptive immune response is uh, elicited and this adaptive immune response is able to uh, promote control of parasite elimination and produce an inflammatory response that is not pathogenic, but that leads to healing. And that can result in the transition from a lesion or a, a symptomatic lesion to a healed lesion in the context, for example, of cell healing or therapeutic, uh, therapeutically achieved cure, or uh, an immune response that sustains the immunopathology which can lead then to a chronic manifestation of cutaneous leishmaniasis depicted in this image here. So the, the data that I'm going to show uh, to you today is essentially trying to call the attention to the fine balance that is required in the microbicidal and immunoregulator, uh, immunoregulated responses that are conducive to both parasite elimination and wound healing as well. This is, I, I just put here primary response and recall responses. This is just to keep in mind for experimental designs and to keep in mind for the experiments that I'm going to show you in a minute. So this is the first piece of data that I wanted to show. Uh, this is a work that we did uh, several years ago, but the question that we had here was whether Leishmania panamensis strains that were isolated from individuals with chronic cutaneous leishmaniasis or from individuals who had self-healing lesions differentially modulated macrophage responses. And the basis for this is because we usually are kind of focused that, uh, let's say Leishmania panamensis causes less severe lesions than Leishmania uh, brasiliensis, but the truth is that there is a range of uh, 
uh, subpopulations of parasites within the same species that causes as well a range of disease manifestations or clinical manifestations of severity. So the first outcome here was very interesting and it was that these primary macrophages, these are human primary macrophages, when infected with strains causing chronic cutaneous leishmaniasis, strongly elicited the uh, upregulation of chemokines that are associated with neutrophil and monocyte activation and recruitment, whereas parasites isolated from patients with self-healing lesions did not uh, strongly modulate this pro-inflammatory response suggesting that this very, this early interaction here where this is a four hour, um, sorry, a 24 hour experiment. This early interaction promotes uh, an activation of macrophages that we suggest leads to a sustained inflammatory response that is conducive to an immunopathological outcome of, of Leishmaniasis. A second piece of evidence is this work uh, um, conducted by our work and also conducted by colleagues in Brazil, where we have shown, or um, the two groups have shown that um, macrophages or monocytes from patients with recurrent or chronic disease are more permissive to infection here in red than those macrophages or monocytes from patients with asymptomatic infection or healthy donors, seen here in green and, um, and black, suggesting that more parasites replicate or are able to get into monocytes and macrophages from individuals that have more chronic disease and, and more pathologic manifestations compared to those that um, have uh, asymptomatic or more uh, less severe uh, uh, disease manifestations. And this occurs not only for Leishmania panamensis, but all, also for Leishmania, Bras uh, Leishmania brasiliensis. As you can see, patients with cutaneous Leishmaniasis have higher parasite burdens, or um, sorry, monocytes from patients uh, infected with brasiliensis have higher parasite burdens compared to those of uh, individuals with subclinical infection in white. So up to now, we see that both from the side of the parasite and the side of the host, there is, it, it, it seems that uh, chronicity or severity of cutaneous leishmaniasis is associated with a heightened uh, monocyte macrophage activation. In terms of adaptive responses, so this is, this is a piece of data that is, is pretty new, and um, I wanted to share it with you first. Um, uh, let's go. Uh, uh, First, with the hypothesis that, that we had. So originally, when these adaptive immune response um, experiments are done, they are particularly conducted with um, PBMCs from individuals with different clinical manifestations, as you can see here in the right panel. So um, to explore what is the, re the recall response of these patients and to understand what is the magnitude of the inflammatory response that is elicited, usually what we do is a recall response. And we see, for example, in these graphs, in the set of graphs, that individuals with more chronic or recurrent disease have heightened levels of production of IL-10, IL-13, so pro-inflammatory as well as anti-inflammatory uh, cytokines suggested that chronicity or uh, severity of cutaneous leishmaniasis is again mediated by a heightened inflammatory response in the human host as contrasted with asymptomatic donors or healthy individuals as seen in the last two bar graphs. But what happens when we take PBMCs from a healthy donor and expose them to these parasite isolates that I mentioned at the beginning that are, that are associated with healing and non-healing uh, outcomes? So what I wanted to show you here is that when we do see, um, uh, total transcriptomic profiles of PBMCs, from this is from three donors, three independent donors with six different parasite strains, six isolated from chronic patients and uh, three from chronic patients and three from self-healing individuals. What we see is in, the, in a PCA profile, we see that the primary separation is due to the host. So this is donor one, donor two, and donor three. But when we account for the variability that host responses introduce into this work, when we do a uh, batch analysis considering um, uh, the host, we see now a nice separation between PBMCs 
exposed to self-healing strains and PBMCs exposed to chronic strains. And what's interesting here is that there is a number of genes that are particularly and differentially modulated between these um, uh, infections with chronic and self-healing uh, uh, strains that are differential between um, uh, or common to the different uh, donors, but differential in terms of the response of these uh, host cells, of these um, human cells. One of the interesting things here is that, once again, we're talking here about PBMCs. So this is a high content of lymphocytes. And when we look at the pathways of um, uh, enriching this particular data set, one of the common things that we find is that type 1 interference signaling is strongly upregulated upon uh, infection with the chronic strains and some signatures of T cell activation. So um, our hypothesis is that there is some uh, early modulation of the um, function of T cells as well uh, that may precede uh, antigen presentation. I mean, uh, yeah, five minutes? Perfect. Perfect. And then the last piece of data that I wanted to show you was in terms of therapeutic response. So what we think about the therapeutic outcome is that this is a, um, an outcome that is uh, multifactorial, meaning interaction with the host, the pathogen, and the drug. And so the first thing that we usually ask is, you know, is parasite elimination uh, required for healing outcomes? So what I wanted to show you here is that when we uh, look at parasite persistence in a group of patients that have healed, all of these patients have healed, we see that in about 13, uh, in about 40% of individuals, there is parasite evidence of parasite persistence by molecular detection of kDNA or 7-SLRNA, meaning that there is a healing phenotype, there is a healed lesion like this, but there are still persistent parasites in these individuals as, as well. And what are the determinants of the, you know, why is it that with persistent parasites we can heal? And the answer uh, relies in part in the immunological response. So what we have here is a, is a panel of expression of different mediators of monocyte, neutropil, and lymphocyte recruitment and activation. And what we can see is that in patients who cure, which is the first column of all these graphs, we have a significant decrease in most of the, mean, uh, in most of the mediators in samples obtained pre-treatment versus post-treatment. And although we see some changes in the failure patients, this decrease is not as strong as in the patients who cure, suggesting that this strong immune regulation in patients who heal is contributory to the um, uh, clinical healing of these uh, lesions in patients. And one last piece of data that I wanted to show you that I find particularly interesting is in the context of therapeutic response when we look at modulation of gene expression. So we're always thinking, you know, the modulation of these genes has to take quite, quite a long time between the, uh, the in, uh, between the, um, uh, um, innate and adaptive immune response to kick in and so on. And what we can see here is a set of genes for which we have analyzed gene expression at different moments after a dosing with antimony. So this is, these are humans that have been uh, dosed with uh, uh, the therapeutic dose for antimony from which we take samples half an hour, one hour, three, five, eight hours, up to 24 hours post-dose. And you can see that very rapidly after dosing, the drug is able to induce modulation of some of these inflammatory mediators um, uh, uh, in PBMCs. And we see a coordinated regulation when we look at specific gene families or gene clusters, we see a specific regulation at different time points where we see uh, uh, innate cells or, or genes associated kicking in at the end of treatment of Th1 cell activation at the beginning of treatment and then uh, receptor cell activation later on after end of treatment. So there is a coordinated uh, um, uh, regulation of gene expression in the context of therapeutic response. So with this, I hope that I have covered different stages of this, uh, uh, what I call the dimensions of the Leishmania host interactions. 
different uh, dimensions in context of different cells that are modulated in context of different uh, perceptions of uh, healing and non-healing responses therapeutically and non-therapeutically achieved. Uh, and uh, just uh, as a final remark, to set the, the tone for discussions that these early interactions, we have to explore them in the context of the combined immunological response that is not only host cells, but also cells of the adaptive response and structural cells in the, in the skin as well. So with this, I finish. I thank you all for uh, your attention. I'm very grateful for this invitation. It's really an honor. And um, I want to thank all the group that has um, contributed to all these uh, years of work. Here we have past and, previous, um, past and present members of our research team, a special thanks to our um, scientific director, Dr. Nancy Saravia, and everyone that has collaborated. And special, special thanks to community leaders and all patients that work with us in our, in our studies. Um, and thanks to our collaborators as well in different universities and our funding institutions, primarily Wellcome Trust, NIH, and Colciencias. Thank you all. Thank you, Adelaida, for the excellent talk. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, is, are there any questions? We have five minutes for questions. Uh, well, if, if we don't have other questions, I can uh, <laughs> put uh, mine. Sure. Uh, first, uh, I mean, uh, really, uh, congratulations and thank you uh, to Adelaida for the, the nice talk. It was really uh, very interesting in terms of uh, putting a, a very uh, comprehensive uh, view of leishmaniasis, human leishmaniasis, and the healing process. And uh, uh, one thing that always uh, was a problem in interpreting this kind of data with human uh, material and parasites is the plasticity of leishmania. I mean, it, it's very difficult really to, to guarantee that we're always working with the uh, same uh, parasite. And uh, with all these classifications, Leishmania, I mean, species and, uh, and everything. So, and uh, she was able really to uh, separate the uh, variations in the human and variation in the parasite. And this is uh, a really uh, interesting aspect. If you could elaborate a little bit more the light on that would be very nice because I guess this is a central point in, uh, in the work. I mean, really trying to separate variations of two very variant systems. Yeah, sure. So methodologically speaking, uh, when we try to dissect from the parasite point of view, what we do is we keep the whole cell constant and we use just one single donor, one single human donor to do all our profiling for the different Leishmania strains. And in contrast for the host, uh, well, the other way around. But what I have to say here is that even though we can see contributions coming from both sides, from the parasite and the host, what I really think is happening is that there is this magical combination between a susceptible host that may lead to chronicity and a parasite that is able to elicit that response. Uh, we have tried to do a more, let's say, sophisticated analysis, which are not really sophisticated, they're just difficult to do, um, to isolate the parasites from the patient and the cells from the same patients and do these combinations. And indeed what we see are uh, in vitro responses that resemble more closely what occurs in humans. So my, my take on that question is, I think it's really difficult to put your hands on fire and say, this is host, this is parasite mediated. Uh, there is contribution from, the, from both, yes. There has to be a tackling of the two systems. So we have to go towards parasite elimination, but as well towards immunoregulation. And the advice is try and do experiments as comprehensive as possible in, the, in, 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 in what's feasible, no? Uh, but, but I would say we as a community, we tend to be very narrow at, the, at you know, we have the reference strain for Leishmania panamensis, we have the reference strain for Leishmania brasiliensis major, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to be a little bit more uh, lax about those things. I don't know if lax is a word in English, but you see what you understand. 
Thank you. Thank you, Adelaida. Sure. Uh, I think that is time for for what that is. You sure. said. Thank you very much. Let me let me stop sharing my screen. Okay. And then uh, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, present uh, Valdez, Val. <laughs> uh, Val uh, got uh, her PhD here in Brazil, and then she had uh, a very uh, long postdoc at uh, Stanford and uh, has a lot of collaborations with the groups in Brazil and uh, outside. She's also a leash maniac, but she's going to talk today about uh, Chagas disease class. That is another of, of her interests in science. And uh, so it's really uh, very good in, uh, to have these two young and very bright uh, uh, scientists <laughs> uh, to present data on uh, diseases of uh, regional importance as leishmaniasis and uh, Chagas disease. And with further delay, I will uh, give the floor to, to Val to present her, uh, her data. Thank you, Bahao. Thank you very much for uh, for being the, the force behind the organization of the seminars with uh, the Immunolac and for baptizing it as well as Immunolac. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be here with uh, Adelaida and, and Emilio as well. Um, so let me share. I trust that you can hear me, yes? I hear you well. Okay. So... Um, Can you see my screen now? Yes. yes. Perfect. Okay, so yes, I, I am also a leishmaniac like uh, Adelaida and Bahao uh, just mentioned. And uh, But today I'll talk about uh, the work that we've been doing in the lab regarding the studies in immunoregulatory networks and the ways we see them as potential targets for preventing diseases. And I will focus on the studies on Chagas disease, but as you just saw uh, through Adelaida's talk, uh, this issue of immunoregulation and the balance between the cytokine network is truly key and critical for determining disease outcome. So I think that a lot of what I'm going to say here will also apply not only for Chagas, but also for uh, other diseases in which uh, immunoregulatory networks play an important role. Um, before I start, I just want to show to the people in the audience uh, that we are here. Uh, we work at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, which is located in the heart uh, of Brazil. Uh, this is uh, what Minas Gerais State looks like, and uh, we hope to entice people to come perhaps to a meeting in Brazil in the near future uh, with the immunology community. And, uh, and this is another attractive thing in Minas Gerais that uh, per Bahau perhaps will not agree as much with me, but I would say that the Minas Gerais food is really the best that we have in the country. Um, and of course, we do work as well a lot in Minas, and this is where we work at the Federal University of Minas Gerais. This is the Institute of Biological Sciences, which is located near the Pampulha Lake, and this is where our lab uh, is located. So uh, our lab has been interested in studying the, in the past years the immunoregulation and the role of immunoregulation in generation of the protective and pathogenic immune responses in human parasitic diseases. And uh, it is very interesting to remember that a lot of what we know regarding immunoregulatory networks came from studies of, of host and parasite interactions. Uh, the seminal work by Mossman and Kaufman uh, regarding the T cell uh, differentiation and dichotomy of CD4 T cells into Th1 and Th2 cells came from studies uh, using a helminth model. And as you know well, uh, also, this dichotomy of Th1 and Th2 and the immunoregulation behind these cells has been clearly associated with the Leishmani infection in the experimental model, in which Th2 cells are associated with a susceptible profile and Th1 cells are associated with resistance in the Leishmani uh, mouse model. So uh, really, uh, parasite-host interactions have been very important in determining a lot of what we know regarding uh, immunoregulation, which is so important for human diseases. 
So uh, it is key also to remember then that uh, the beginning of these studies came uh, by showing that uh, a T cell precursor uh, may develop under the pressure of different cytokine microenvironments into different populations that will display distinct functions in the immune response. So for example, the Th1 cells are uh, developed under the pressure of IL-12 and gamma interferon, and they will lead to the production of cytokines that will trigger a cellular inflammatory response that in the case of intracellular pathogens is very important for leading to the control of this pathogen. However, if this is not controlled well, this can also lead to tissue destruction. And that is where other T cell subpopulations may come into play to regulate and to modulate this response, avoiding tissue destruction, but also to triggering other types of responses, such as, for example, uh, production of antibodies that is also critical for controlling disease later on in different times. Uh, not only T cells, but also, for example, macrophages can display different functions based upon the different cytokines that they produce. So uh, this cytokine network really is key in determining the type of response that will be established. And as Adelaida just showed, another important point is when these different responses will be established. So this is what we've been um, focusing our studies in the lab. Um, so today, uh, what I will show you is regarding uh, human Chagas disease, as I mentioned before, and uh, uh, most of this work that I'm going to show you has been done at the Federal University of Minas Gerais with a fantastic group of professionals led by Professora Maria do Carmo Pereira Nunes, whom we've been working for over uh, 15 years. Uh, and the patients are uh, all uh, received at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, and they've been followed for, for many years by Carminha and her group, which uh, by following these patients very closely are able to determine very well and very um, with a very sophistication uh, their, their uh, clinical forms within the Chagas disease. So when we talk about the clinical evolution of Chagas disease, um, we have to remember that uh, the disease is caused by the infection with Trypanosoma cruzi, and uh, the patients undergo an acute phase that can progress to a chronic phase if uh, the disease is not treated at this point or if there is treatment failure. And during this chronic phase that can last for the entire life of, of the patient, the great majority of the individuals will remain in a clinical form that is called indeterminate, which is the asymptomatic form of Chagas disease. But about 30% of the individuals will develop very severe clinical forms, especially the cardiac clinical form that can lead to the death of the patient. This clinical form, the pathology associated to it is clearly mediated by inflammation. And again, as Adelaida just mentioned, this is where the host response really seems to play a very important role. In fact, I would say that the host immune response is key, not only in mediating pathology, but also in maintaining a, a protective or a less pathogenic response in the patients of the indeterminate clinical form. Unfortunately, as of now, we don't have biomarkers that can allow for us to determine exactly what patients will develop uh, the cardiac clinical form from the indeterminate group, which uh, is a, a very pressing matter in Chagas disease. And an important question, obviously, is what can we do to in, to stop the transition from the non-inflammation profile to the one that leads to the inflammation and to the severe clinical forms of the disease. Can we control this inflammation? Can we stop this process? This is an important question that, uh, we, uh, that we've been uh, devoting a lot of our studies in the, in the past years. So this cartoon summarizes a lot of, of what we know about the host immune response and chronic phase of uh, Chagas disease. And obviously because of the chronic nature of the disease, a lot that has been done is regarding the cellular immune response. And this really summarizes the work of our group, but also many other groups in Brazil, in Argentina, in other countries, uh, which have basically shown that circulating T cells from patients with both 
clinical forms of Chagas disease are excellent producers of cytokines, particularly the CD4 T cells that I mentioned before that can display distinct uh, characteristics. And these cells, as well as the antigen-presenting cells, who can also produce inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines, seem to be important orchestrators of the immune response in Chagas disease. Together with that, activated CD8 T cells expressing uh, inflammatory cytokines as well as cytotoxic molecules are the main cell type that is found in the tissue, in the cardiac tissue of patients that have cardiomyopathy. And it is believed that CD8 T cells are very important in actually mediating the tissue destruction that leads to the cardiomyopathy. So this, uh, this uh, shows to us that the, the response that is mediated by T cells during the chronic phase of Chagas disease, as well as antigen presenting cells, uh, have different characteristics, but they do interact together in a way that may be determining for uh, the progression of the disease. And uh, about that, uh, the thinking about the immunoregulatory potential of these cells and the production of different cytokines, what the many different studies have shown to us is that although uh, there is a predominance of an inflammatory cytokine that is associated with the cardiac clinical form of the disease, which is the inflammatory form of the disease, there is also a more balanced or a regulatory environment that is associated with the maintenance of the indeterminate clinical form. So essentially, if we take the immunoregulatory network and all we've learned about it in the context of human Chagas disease, what we can say is that the cardiac clinical form is associated with the inflammatory environment and the indeterminate clinical form is associated with a more modulatory environment. Now, it is very important for us to understand what are the cells that produce these different cytokines and who are the main players in this process of generating an inflammatory or a regulatory environment, because by learning that is where we can actually interfere with the progression of this response. We know, and I mentioned before, that the inflammatory cytokines, and Adelaida also mentioned that in her talk, the inflammatory cytokines are key for activating cells to control the parasite. So we cannot just simply come here and eliminate the inflammatory cytokines because we would prevent that. But if we can interfere with a particular cell population and allow for others to produce these important cytokines, it's possible that we can reduce inflammation and therefore reduce pathology. So when we did, uh, the, at the beginning of our studies, one of the interesting things that we learned when we took the contribution of T cell populations for the production of gamma interferon and IL-10 as a correlate of inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines, respectively, what we found was that in patients of the indeterminate clinical form, only 27% of the IL-10 production came from lymphocytes that were either CD4 or CD8 positives. And in patients of the cardiac clinical form, only 40%, 45% of the gamma interferon production came from CD4 or CD8 T cells. So about 55%, over 50% of the gamma in cardiacs came from non-CD4 nor CD8 cells, and 70% of the IL-10 in indeterminate patients, which is key for maintaining the regulatory environment, came from non-CD4, non-CD8 lymphocytes. So that is what led us to look and study this particular T cell population that had actually been studied before in leishmaniasis in the group uh, by uh, Liz Antonelli under Ken's, uh, Ken Golub's supervision. So who are these double negative T cells? The double negative T cells, as the name says, are T cells that do not express CD4, oops, sorry, CD4 or CD8 co-receptors. They make up about two to 4% of the T cells in the periphery. They can express T cell receptors that are either alpha, beta, or gamma, delta. They are a very heterogeneous group uh, of T cells. 
they recognize antigens not presented by regular um, uh, MHC molecules, but by molecules of the CD1 family, mostly. They are able to respond quickly upon stimulation, and importantly, they are able to tolerate chronic stimulation because they don't express the score receptors. Very interesting to think that they also recognize glycoconjugates, which are the most important molecules to stimulate these cells. And as we know, the surface of Trypanosoma cruzi is really decorated with a variety of glycoconjugates. Therefore, the double negative T cells really seem to be uh, an important cell in the chronic phase of Chagas disease and in the establishment of the uh, regulatory, immunoregulatory networks in patients of indeterminate and cardiac clinical forms. So the first studies that we did in the lab with Fernanda Villani and Livia Passos was to really show that these double negative T cells could express different cytokines and in fact, we show that these cells produce a huge amount of all kinds of cytokines, inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines, uh, confirming their importance in the production of cytokines in the chronic phase of Chagas disease. And importantly, even though they produce all kinds of different cytokines, when we evaluate the ratio of anti-inflammatory over inflammatory cytokines, which gives an idea of the balance in the response of these individuals, what we found was that the patients with the indeterminate clinical form display the balanced cytokine response from the double negative T cells, but the patients of the cardiac clinical form had a bias toward an inflammatory profile by the double negative T cells. So they seem to behave differently in patients with the indeterminate and cardiac clinical forms of the disease. All of these studies that we do in vitro with cells from patients, really uh, what they do is to reveal to us the recall response of these uh, different cell populations because these individuals are with a chronic disease and typically stimulated in vitro with parasite antigens. And this is just to remind you all that these recall responses after an individual has been presented with an infection, uh, they progress from a activation of a naive population toward at least the establishment of two different populations of memory cells a memory profile that we call central memory cells, which uh, display molecules that lead to their uh, recirculation through secondary lymphoid organs for further activation, and then they'll be able to perform effector functions but also the effector memory cells that are more are activated faster, don't need to go through secondary lymphoid organs and can direct the home to the site of infection and mediate, um, and, mediate their, uh, and display their effector functions. In the case of Chagas disease, previous studies had focused on the role of CD4 and CD8 uh, positive cells uh, and their different memory, central memory and effector memory populations, showing an association with the different clinical forms of Chagas disease. And this was done by uh, Albareda et al. in Argentina and Fiusa et al. in Brazil. And we became interested in trying to determine what were the different memory subpopulations of double negative T cells that were responsible for the production of these immunoregulatory cytokines and whether we could interfere with that response toward the benefit of the patient. So the hypothesis was that a distinct double negative T cell memory profile was associated with the pathology development in human Chagas disease. So in order to study that, essentially we uh, took cells from patients with the indeterminate and cardiac clinical forms of Chagas disease that are under the care of uh, Professora Maria do Carmo Pereira Nunes and her group at the Federal University of Minas Gerais with really well-defined and polar clinical forms. And uh, we took the cells and stimulated them in vitro with uh, live parasites. We performed flow cytometry to determine essentially the activation state of the different subpopulations of double negative memory cells, but importantly, the cytokine profile of these cells. 
And the way we did that was following the instructions that Salusto et al. did in defining the different memory populations based upon the expression of two surface markers, which are CCR7 and CD45RA, in which we can find here central memory cells, effector memory cells, naive cells, and effector cells. So by using this strategy, this flow cytometry start strategy, within the double negative T cells expressing either alpha, beta, or gamma delta T cell receptor, we selected the population and went on to evaluate these activation markers and cytokines. So this plot here, uh, based on the expression of CD45RA and CCR7, shows the distribution of these molecules within the, the, uh, the subpopulations of double negative T cells. And uh, based on the expression of these different markers in which the more red, the stronger the expression. So for example, this region here has a high expression of CCR7, which is consistent here with the central memory population. So based on the together expression of these markers, we can determine the position occupied by the different memory populations, the central memory and the effector memory cells that we are going to uh, continue in our study. If we take this profile now, and divide it within the patients with the cardiac and the indeterminate clinical form, the first thing that we clearly see in this, in this uh, picture is that in patients of the cardiac clinical form, we have a predominance of the effector memory population, whereas in the patients with the indeterminate clinical form, we have a predominance of the central memory population. So this visual, uh, this visual determination of these populations can also be expressed in, 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 in numbers. So we take uh, the frequency of the, these cells, the central memory, the effector memory, and also of the other populations in patients of the indeterminate and cardiac clinical forms. And here in white, we have non-stimulated cells. And in gray, we have cells that were exposed to the parasite. And what we can clearly see here is that in patients with the indeterminate clinical form, we have a predominance in relation to the cardiac patients of the central memory population. And the clear opposite is seen regarding the effector memory population, which is more predominant in the patients with the cardiac disease, either before or after stimulation, as compared to indeterminates. For both subsets of the double negative T cells, either expressing alpha, beta, or the gamma delta TCR. So if we take now the, the ratio of central memory to effector memory cell, that is also translating what we see in these graphs to the right, to the left here, showing that this ratio is higher in patients of the indeterminate clinical form as compared to the cardiac clinical form, clearly associating the central memory with indeterminate and the effector memory cells uh, with the cardiac clinical form within the double negative T cell subpopulation. So the next question was regarding uh, the point that we were very interested in, which was the cytokine expression upon recall uh, in, uh, by these different populations, the central memory and the effector memory that were predominant in the different clinical forms. And what we can see in general here is that the double negative T cells still are able to produce all different types of cytokines, in this case, gamma interferon and IL-10, uh, very, very, uh, in a very powerful manner. But what, what we see clearly here is that while the central memory population seems to be more responsive in the patients with the indeterminate clinical form, the effector memory population seems to be more responsive in the patients with uh, the, with the cardiac clinical form uh, of Chagas disease. Uh, 20 for the minutes, so. Of, okay. Uh, for both gamma interferon and IL-10. And uh, now, if we look at the double positive cells that express both IL-10 and gamma interferon, which was shown by Dragana Jankovic at the NIH as associated with a protective response, what we see is that these cells are predominant in patients, in central memory cells of patients with the indeterminate clinical form as compared to the cardiac clinical form of the disease. 
Interestingly, the activation marker CD69 seems to be expressed after activation as actually as expected. But one interesting thing that we found when we evaluated the expression of CD69 was that upon stimulation with parasite antigen, there was a decrease in the expression of CD69 in cells from patients of the cardiac clinical form. And that can be seen in these graphs here to the right, where we see a predominant uh, expression of CD69 in indeterminate patients and a very low expression of this activation marker in central memory cells from cardiac patients. And this was concurrent also with a reduction of IL-10, which can be seen here in numerical terms that we see that the central memory cells from cardiac patients seem to be less activating, activated and producing less IL-10 than the ones from the patients of the indeterminate clinical form. These graphs here show an important thing to us, which is the distinct evolution of double negative T cell memory populations in patients of the indeterminate and cardiac clinical forms of Chagas disease. So this top plot here shows the dichotomy, the divergence of the memory cells from the naive population in purple toward either effector memory or central memory populations. But when we look at the same plot now only for patients with the cardiac clinical form or the indeterminate clinical form, what we see is that the divergence in the cardiac form goes toward clearly toward the effector memory cells, whereas in indeterminate individuals, it goes toward the central memory uh, population, showing that is, there is clear uh, difference in the evolution of the memory population in the two different clinical forms. The plots to the right show to us that central and effector memory profiles can discriminate almost perfectly, and I call your attention here to the double negative gamma delta T cell subpopulation, almost perfectly between indeterminate and cardiac Chagas patients, where we have a high expression of IL-10 and CD69 associated with the indeterminate form, and a high expression of gamma interferon by central and infector memory cells with the cardiac clinical form of the disease. Importantly, the central memory and the effector memory profiles are associated with clinical parameters of disease severity. In this case here, we have the left ventricular ejection fraction, which is a fraction that measures the ability of the heart to pump blood. So uh, the higher the ejection fraction, the better the cardiac function. And so what we did was a correlation between this, uh, this function and the frequency of central memory and effector memory populations. And again, I call your attention particularly to the gamma delta double negative T cell population in which the central memory population is positively correlated with a good cardiac function and the effector memory population is negatively correlated with a cardiac, a measure of cardiac function, implying that central memory really is associated with a better cardiac function, whereas the effector memory is associated with a worse cardiac function. So obviously what we want is for the people, for the patients to have a good memory response. And our question was, if the cardiac patients already developed a response that is not good for them, can we mess with that? Can we change that? Can we interfere with that memory response to the benefit of the patient? And uh, so the idea was really to rescue, to try and rescue uh, the response uh, of, of uh, effector memory cells in cardiac patients. We had previously shown that CD1D molecule was key in activating the double negative T cells. So we designed our strategy uh, to determine that, to try to decrease the activation of the double negative T cells by blocking the interaction of the CD1D molecule with these cells using an antibody anti-CD1D. So essentially we took cells from now only cardiac Chagas patients, stimulated in vitro with the parasite, 
blocked with the monoclonal, monoclonal antibody anti-CD1D and evaluated what happened to the memory responses, hoping that we would change the profile of effector memory cells. And what we did was measure the expression of gamma interferon and IL-10. And this slide shows to you that whereas there was no significant differences in the expression of these cytokines before and after blocking in the central memory compartment, we could see that the effector memory compartment, particularly of the gamma delta subpopulation, which was the more responsive one, uh, uh, when we block the activation of the effector memory population, we increase the expression of IL-10 by these cells. And here in this bottom sign, what we see is also an increase in the expression of that uh, profile of cytokines associated with the protective response, which is the double expressor of gamma interferon and IL-10. So this shows that this blocking does rescue the IL-10 producing cells within the effector memory uh, subpopulation of double uh, negative T cells. So what we showed here today was that the central memory double negative T cells are predominant in patients of the indeterminate clinical form. They display a balanced cytokine production and they are correlated with better ventricular function. On the other hand, the other subpopulation of memory cells, the effector memory cells, are predominant in cardiac patients. They have a more inflammatory cytokine profile, and they do correlate with a worse ventricular function. And to take home, which was very exciting to us, is that we show that it is possible to manipulate the effect memory double negative T cell response in cardiac patients to achieve a more balanced cytokine profile, similar to the one that we observed in central memory cells of indeterminate individuals, hoping that this would lead to the establishment or to the maintenance of a protective response that would be beneficial for the patient. So this uh, means that these are potential immunotherapeutic targets that we could try to use to uh, uh, avoid tissue destruction in Chagas disease. So that is why it is important to determine the source of cytokines so we can interfere with the immunoregulatory networks in a way that can benefit the patient. With that, I, I finished the presentation thanking, obviously, Maria do Carmo Pereira Nunes, uh, who is a doctor that is responsible with her group for the care of the patients with Chagas disease that we've been working with, Ken Golub and Liz Antonelli for the studies in the double negative T cells at the beginning of, of these studies and also currently. In the lab, uh, lots of people that are involved in the Chagas group, but particularly Livia Passos and Carolina Ko for directly performing these experiences, these experiments, but also Luisa and Fernanda, uh, Juliana and Rodolfo also from the group who are key for the implementation of these studies. And last but not least, the funding agencies, uh, uh, the National Institutes for Science and Technology in Tropical Diseases, CAPES, CNPq, and FAPEMIGI, uh, and uh, the NIH for the R1. And uh, we obviously hope that the funding agencies can uh, continue fund doing, funding this uh, research in our lab, as well as in everybody else's uh, labs, for that matter. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to respond to any questions. OK, thank you, Val, uh, for the very nice uh, presentation with, uh, I mean, very important perspective in terms of uh, contributing to really better care in, uh, in Chagas disease. So this is really a, a major aspect to be really uh, highlighted. And uh, it's possible that, uh, and we hope that uh, we're going to have further progress in these uh, clinical applications. Uh, and uh, so this is, uh, do you have any plans to uh, do studies in terms of, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, recovering uh, equilibrium in uh, real uh, clinical assays? So, so yes, that that is obviously the uh, the, the the dream, right, Bahá? The the desire to be able to take that to that clinic. Uh, we are still performing uh, studies with the double negative T cells in indeterminate patients to be sure that uh, the tempering with this population does not interfere with 
uh, you know, other characteristics that might be important to maintain, let's say it that way. So we're currently in the process of developing more studies with patients of the indeterminate clinical form and with different degrees of cardiomyopathy to be able to see if we can take that to a more clinical setting. We, we hope so, we hope to be able to do that. In fact, the use of anti-CD1D, for example, is a strategy that is used in other, uh, in other diseases. So we are hopeful that this can be also used in, in, in our patients, but we still have a little bit to go before we get there. Well, uh, there's uh, the last question before. Uh, it's really from uh, Adelaida, she could uh, speak herself about the uh, frequency of double negative cells uh, being predictive in terms of severity. Do you have an idea before clinical manifestation if the, uh, this balance can really have some predictive value? So that's a very important question, Adelaida. We, uh, so there are clear differences in, term, in functional terms if you look at the double negative T cell population in indeterminate and cardiac patients. So as of now, what I can say is that there is a correlation with the different clinical forms regarding their function, but we don't yet have a follow-up in terms of, say, a patient that is indeterminate, that the cells have a particular characteristic, if this indeterminate is going to progress to cardiac disease, or even in the cardiac form, if a mild cardiomyopathy a profile can be predictive of that. But this is something that we are currently doing. So we, we have the, the NIH project that, uh, that uh, targets to uh, identify the component that stimulates this cell, uh, whether it's a host or a parasite component, but also that allows for us to continue studying these patients to, to see if what you know, you're saying, and this is a hypothesis that we have, that we can use this as a predictive uh, population as well. We hope so. Thank you. Uh, and uh, then, uh, of course, uh, maybe we can, uh, we're already uh, five, uh, 15 or uh, 11. So maybe we can uh, give the uh, final words for both the speakers. And uh, if you would like to comment uh, something or some, uh, I mean, not comment or scientific, but about the anything that we want to in this context that we are living in terms of uh, integration of our uh, knowledge in the region. <laughs> so maybe we follow the same uh, Adelaide and then Bob. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, as I said at the beginning, to me, this was a really, um, really interesting opportunity and I'm honored to have participated. Uh, the fact that we can share as a community, even in these times of difficulty for everyone, is very special. Um, and that even we can see our faces like this, it's great. Um, and I, I just hope that we can continue doing this type of, uh, of work um, in the future. I already, you know, it, it immediately sparks ideas of things to do. So, you know, I already have my, my questions for Wall because we see these double negative uh, cell populations that we never pay, pay attention to. So uh, maybe th those are things that may be now interesting to look at as well. So thank you for the opportunity. And uh, Val? Yes, it is. I totally agree with Adelaide. I think it's a fabulous opportunity. I hope we really can continue this. Bahao and I do have plans to continue in, with, uh, with the seminars. I actually had a few suggestions already, Bahao, from colleagues of, uh, of other people that we can invite from the Latin American Caribbean community in immunology. And, uh, and I do hope that uh, we can continue this, uh, this um, collaboration. It's, it's very clear that we have a lot to share. It's very clear that the problems that we deal with uh, really will benefit a lot from bringing together the community. I see people in the audience from, from Argentina, lots of people from Brazil. I see a couple of people from Colombia as well. So I think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it's going to catch. We just have to, to keep, keep doing it. So it's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Bahao, for really bringing this idea forward, and Emilio for joining us with this and with the support of Alai, and of course, Adelaida for the fabulous presentation. I think it was a perfect 
uh, perfect person to, to start out the seminar series with us. Thank you very much. Yeah, we shall uh, be proud of uh, the quality of the presentations. It was a very fantastic uh, webinar that we had and uh, gives a lot of uh, stimulus to really uh, put forward uh, the, the following seminars. And uh, I uh, then give the floor to, uh, to Emilio to really close the session in the name of all of us. Well, I, uh, thank you, Varan and Manuel. Um, it's a great uh, project to do it uh, in this uh, particular circumstance. It's, it's important that the, the scientists uh, find at least in, in a webinar because of uh, the restriction for moving, for, for traveling, is uh, causing really uh, a delay in the, in, in the collaboration work. So it is important to keep ongoing with this kind of seminars and it was my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you for your... Okay, bye-bye and wait for the, uh, uh, the next uh, seminar in the series. <laughs> yes. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> Have a great day all.